Okay, we're in chapter 25 of the book of Shmuel, Shmuel Aleph, Samuel 1. And we've been learning the story, learning about the story of David Amelech in his uh, hiding from Shaul, from King Saul. And we learned last week that Shaul actually acknowledged, admitted that David deserves to be king. He's more righteous than him. And the fact that David tore his garment also proved it, that he's going to be the next king. And so there was some type of a admission, uh, acknowledgement that, um, that, that basically uh, David is meant to become king. So in, right after that, it mentions that Shmuel passed, passes away. And the connection seems to be that once Shaul acknowledged David as being the, the future king, you know, that was uh, Shmuel had accomplished his mission. Shmuel finished his, he fulfilled his mission. And now uh, um, uh, Shmuel has accomplished what he needed to. And um, and he passed away then. Now, the the story that we're dealing with here is a story of a man by the name of Novel, who's very wicked, but he's married to someone who's very righteous, Abigail. Don't ask me who their matchmaker was. <laughs> I don't I don't know how they uh, well the opposite the track they say. So. But uh, it is a little surprising that uh, Novel and Abigail are a husband and wife. But Novel, now Novel was a very wealthy man and very selfish. And in fact, we mentioned that whenever people used to ask him for money, he, he took advantage of the fact that he worked in one place and he lived in another. So whenever they wanted money, he would say, oh, I give the poor people where I work, that's where I give my charity. When the people where he worked asked for charity, say, oh, I give charity and where I live. You know, so he always had the right answer to um, uh, what to say. And that was, he thought he was uh, smart by uh, getting, getting out of giving charity and being stingy, which uh, of course is very foolish because ultimately, People are blessed when they give charity. Let me mute everyone here. There are, there are. I believe uh, the the. Uh, I believe the Ramba mentions, uh, and I, it's probably based on a Gemara that a person uh, can have eleven times as much if they give whatever they give to charity. But uh, the talent. I mean, the, there's another place where it says give a tithing. In order to get rich, aser taser, aser b'shvil shatis asher. If you give, in or you could give give in order to get rich. That's why there's a double language um, for the word uh, do, donating a tithe. Uh, so in in any event, he was very stingy, and uh, the the people that were with David and David himself, they used to protect novels sheep and novels uh workers and they were very helpful to them because they were there in the fields and they would they would help them out if there were any enemies and so and so david waited for the opportune time and the opportune time he felt was now here right after shmuel passed away it was a time of harvesting, and um, it was a it was a, a time of um, uh, celebration for uh, for for Novel's wealth. This was the the a time where he was making a, a celebration, and uh, it, because of that, he David thought this is a good time to ask him for a donation not just because we deserve charity, but because we worked for it. I mean, we, you know, we've, we've, we've done, we've really protected you. And uh, why don't you, um, 
why don't you uh, help us out at this time when everything is working out for you? Now, the, uh, this was a, a time when the, the celebration that, that Novel was doing uh, had to do also with the shearing of the wool. This was a, a special time that that uh, he was making a celebration. Uh, thousands of sheep were, they were, was, uh, he had thousands of sheep and uh, uh, they were sharing it. You can imagine what type of a successful uh, time it was where he was making, making this big, big party. So David came to him and uh, David didn't come. He sent an entourage of his people to, uh, to go and ask him, uh, first of all, butter him up, wish him, uh, in verse 6, he mentions peace. May you be at peace. May your household be at peace. And all of every peace be upon all that is yours. And one of the commentaries explains, well, it's based on the, uh, there's a statement in the uh, of Easter of Nassim, one of the the um, the writings of the Mish Mishnah rabbis, that he writes that 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 the um, whoever makes peace within his household is considered as if he made peace within all of Israel. That uh, peace is you can you get a lot more for your buck when you make peace even within a family, or sometimes maybe that's even hard harder within within family but making peace uh within family is considered like making peace amongst all israel and um one of the commentaries adds to that saying if you look at the verse it says you should have peace and your household should have peace how do you accomplish peace on your in your household is only if you have inner peace if you have inner peace you'll be able to have peace you'll be able to convince others to be at peace. You need to have yourself peace first. And uh, that's in verse six. And uh, then in verse uh, eight, so he says, ask, he says, uh, the ask your attendants, uh, tell Novel, the owner, to ask his attendants, they will tell you so. Therefore, let my attendants find favor, find favor in your eyes. We have come because of your celebration, and please give whatever you can to your servants and to your son, to David. So this is what they are going to ask Novel. Now, Novel, they, they haven't reached him yet, but this is what David told his servants, told his people to ask Novel. Now, what they said, this is a time of celebration. What they're saying is, we don't want to impose on you at a bad time, but now is a time when, when things are good. This should be an opportune time for you that we're at putting in a little request. Now, Rashi mentions another explanation, and that is uh, that it is Erev Rosh Hashanah. So he's calling it Yom Tov because it's, right before Yom Tov, right before the holiday, and we need food for the holiday. This sounds like a source that before Rosh Hashanah, it's an opportune time to give tzedakah, to give help people out for the holiday. People, um, we, we know this about Pesach and before, maybe before Sukkot, but uh, here we see Rosh Hashanah as well, the time to give tzedakah for people to be able to celebrate, even though you might think, well, Rosh Hashanah is more of a day of judgment. Maybe it's not necessarily uh, a time of, uh, you know, celebrating that, uh, you, you know, you need, uh, that you need to put out a, a nice spread for, for Rosh Hashanah. For, for other holidays, it's a time of rejoicing. But Rosh Hashanah is a, a time of judgment. But here you see that it is, it's a, it's a considered a, of course, it's considered a yomtiv, but uh, uh, David's people are going to use this as a claim 
why he should provide for them. So it's it's a it's a holiday, and um, it's a festive day. And they were asking that maybe you could uh, help us celebrate the holiday prop properly. In fact, the Rambam writes, Maimonides writes that the people who they make themselves a beautiful uh, holiday uh, celebration. It's really not a holiday celebration. It's really a celebration of their own stomach. If they don't invite the poor, they don't help out the, the needy, and uh, instead they just make a big celebration, that's not a holiday celebration. That, they've, they've, got the whole, they've got the point all wrong. That's considered a celebration of the stomach. And a holiday celebration is when you invite others that need or that could benefit, that are sad and could benefit. That's when it's considered a holiday celebration. So this is the request that David tells his people. And we're up to verse 9. Verse 9 and chapter 25. So, chapter 25, verse 9, David's attendants came and spoke in accordance with the, all these words to Novel in David's name and then rested. So, the, David sent the, this group of people there and To, to, to Novel. Uh, the verse earlier mentioned that it was 10. He sent 10 attendants to, to Novel to put in this request. And uh, they came, they rested. And um, and in verse 10, Novel replied to David's servants and said, Who is David and who is, the, who is the son of Yishai? These days the rebellious servants have increased each against his master. Shall I take my bread and my water and my meat that I have slaughtered for my shearers and give them to the men about whose origin I don't know? So this is the answer that Novel gives to David's 10 attendants. Now, Rabbi. Yes. In verse 8, why does David say uh, that you'll give, you'll give, and he calls himself to your son, David? I don't see any of the commentaries mention anything, or that I see in the families. Yeah, I mean, it seems like that's the terminology they would use when they, you know, they wanted to show respect to someone else. Like they're saying, you're, my, you're like, a, a, you know, a parent, you know, you, and so on. It's, it's sort of a, a term used as respect. That's what it seems. Um, let's see, uh, verse 8. Oh, the bin Chadavid. You know, that, that's uh, like a little humble, hum, you know, acting humble. You can become as generous as my father by giving. Sounds good. So, um, so verse uh, 10. So this is, I'm sorry, verse 10 and 11. So Novel answered, uh, the, the uh, answered in this, in this very negative way. Now, the... Yalka Chamaini, one of the Midrashic sources, says over here that Novel says to David's servants, he says, because of two drops of oil, that's why you, you have such arrogance. You think you're the anointed one because you got these, uh, you got anointed from Shmuel. Where is Shmuel and where, are his, where is his oil? Where is he? He's dead. That was, that was Novel's line that he was, that he was saying very, very disrespectful. Now, the, the, there, there is a statement in the Jerusalem Talmud that says that Novel's arrogance came because he was a descendant of Kalev. And he felt 
he maybe is more qualified to the throne than David. Now, that's a little crazy to think such a thing. This guy is a low life, uh, a, 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 you know, a real lowly person. And yet he thinks he's more qualified than David to, to the throne. And therefore he's going to, uh, like, like he thinks after show, he should be chosen. Is that, is that what he really thinks? But that's what, the, that's what it mentions there, that, that he was looking, he was like angry that Shmuel anointed David. Why did he choose David? Now, another point is that David's lineage had its questions to it. There were some questions to David's lineage. And the, the reason that, that there were questions to it was the fact that David's great-grandmother was Rus. And Rus was a convert from the Moabites. And officially, a Moabite convert is not allowed to marry a regular Jew. They could convert and become Jewish, but they can't marry a regular Jew. Anyone from Moab, Ammon and Moab, they're not allowed to marry. Um, even the 10th generation, it says, can't marry a Jew. And the, there was so, so there was always this question, so does that apply to a woman convert as well, or is that only applicable to men converts? And it was always something that they debated, the Talmud and the Talmud and, and uh, in the time of the uh, prophets. This was something that was questioned numerous times. Is, uh, and so therefore, Novel, um, uh was, according to one explanation, he was ridiculing David's lineage by saying, ah, who's, who, you know, who is he anyway? I don't know his lineage. We, it might not even be a kosher, regular kosher Jew. It might, it might be... Uh, you know, someone who's not really a uh, proper regular Jew. And so there was, um, the, the, you know, that, that was a question that uh, could be, it, possibly that's the explanation that Novel was degrading and, and acting so, um, so rough to, to David. Now, what, what is even, the, the truth is we're not surprised because we know that Novel is an evil guy. What's more surprising to us probably is the next verse and uh, the verse after it. Really, David's attendants, we're in verse 12 now. David's attendants uh, turned around to their way and they went back, arrived and reported to him in accordance with all these words. David said to his men, each man gird his sword. Each man girded his sword, and David too girded his sword. About 400 men went after David, and 200 others stayed with the belongings. So they told David what, what happened the, and what the, the reply was. And uh, David was, it, it, it seems from the verse, like he lost it. Like he was so angry, so unex he so did not expect this cruelty from Novel that, that he's ready to go and, and kill Novel. And he's taking 400 people with him, which is also a little surprising. What does he need 400 people? He could kill, he himself could kill 400 people probably uh, without any help. And he needs 400 people to help him kill one person. But uh, the, um, the, the, the thing that the commentary, so, so this deserves uh, some commentary over here. And what the, the, the Gemara discusses this as well. And the Gemara says that, this is brought in the Radak over here, it brings a Gemara. The Gemara says that they learn from this story a law about the way things work in the court. When you judge a capital case, so... 
they learn certain laws that you have to, one of the laws that they see here is based on the fact that um, each man girded his sword and only afterwards does it say David too girded his sword. Why did David gird his sword afterwards? And the answer is they, they discussed this issue is Novel deserving the death penalty? Does Novel really deserve the death penalty or not? And when it comes to capital cases, you first start with the least authoritative rabbi, and only in the end does the most authoritative rabbi give his verdict. And the reason is, if the, because if the, if the most authoritative, the, the, the most knowledgeable rabbi gives his verdict first, then no one else will want to say anything against him. And so therefore, anyone that's in the court, in the, when it comes to capital cases, the least rabbinic source always has, has to say his uh, opinion first, and only then later does the greatest rabbi say his, his opinion. And of course, we go by the majority, and it has to be majority of two for, for, for the death penalty, majority of one to, um, for innocence. So the the um, the uh, verse here tells us that David was what it's telling us is that David sort of like brought up the subject should does the person deserve death and only later did he give his verdict which was he girded his sword but first uh, they discussed it so it seems like they concluded that there was. The, the, that this novel is deserving the death penalty. Now, why would he be deserving the death penalty? What did he do? If you don't give charity, do you deserve death? I mean, it, it might be something that God might give such a punishment, but it, it doesn't seem that that would be the punishment punishable by a court. A court uh, it does not give a death penalty for someone who doesn't give charity. Yes, Ben. He's talking, he's talking really against David himself as, as he was anointed for, to kingship and against Shmuel. Right. So the, the, well, talking against a prophet, I don't know if that's punishable by a, a court to give but a maybe death penalty. Together, I don't know. But, but, but what you said about David, David, if David is the king, so... What Novel did was it was considered, um, this is considered moired b'malchus, which means rebellious against the king. And being rebellious against the king uh, is punishable by death. And so this is, um, this is uh, what, what, what David and the people that were with him, that you know, his his colleagues, all of his uh, followers, seems like that's what they they felt. Rabbi, yes. What about withholding food from somebody that's starving? That's not just withholding charity. It's almost like a uh, like you're killing somebody by keeping them from having food. Right. The problem is that it, it's not a active killing. It's in, therefore it could deserve maybe from God such a penalty, um, but it's it's uh, it's not something that you can um, you know that you can uh, say you you know you actually killed someone. I don't think the court has the right. There are limitations of what the court can kill for, and of course if you you know hold the gun up to someone and they're warned, you know that that's the penalty. Uh, you know that you can get the death penalty. Uh, in Jewish court, but if, if a person withholds something, yes, uh, Isaac. I think also, I, before, just conceptually, even without looking at the specifics, before you can hold somebody liable or responsible <laughs> for violating some duty, which is what a crime is, or even uh, when you're suing somebody for negligence, you violated a duty. 
you have to have a duty to that person first. If you walk down the street and see somebody shooting somebody, you have no obligation to step in. So the fact that you don't feed them cannot be, at least isn't under any law I know, your responsibility. If, however, you have a chryas for somebody, you're responsible for somebody, or you have, you're supposed to be delivering food to them or whatever, and then you don't, that's a different issue. I'm, I'm not yeah, sure. That's... It sounds interesting what you're saying, Isaac, but I'm not 100% sure that you could say you're not responsible to step in. I mean, uh, you know, it's, it's a case of... Uh, uh, you know, that you're able to save someone who's, uh, who's, uh, who's being a near duff who's For, yeah, yeah. killed. Like you said, yeah, like you yeah, said yeah, Hashem yeah. Not sure. can work that out. The question is whether we can enforce anything, whether we as a Bezdin can right, do as a court. So there. capital case, right. capital cases, right, capital cases. But yeah, but the person is, you are responsible and obligated to do certain things. So I think that that answers your question, though. Um, in addition to the fact that it could be that that it wasn't death, it wasn't it wasn't causing death; it was causing suffering and starvation. But they didn't actually die. So it, you know, it, it, there's a there's a difference between you know not you know not not you know not celebrating yuntiv and not having food, or you know, did he know how starving they were? You know, there's a lot of questions to be asked before you give someone a death penalty when it comes Rabbi to uh, causing death. Um, yeah. Yes. 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 Nina. Um, didn't wasn't it said that they helped to defend the yes. sheep, but they yeah. protected the sheep? So in that sense, there would be, as, as Isaac terms it, achrayas. I mean, in the sense that they were, as uh, soldiers for him, really, they were helping to defend. Him. So you know, and and, and this is. Yeah, I don't know if that would course, get a death penalty. I, I don't know. I don't know if I. Do. Withholding wages may not constitute a death penalty, but it, it just makes it an aggravating condition because maybe they were risking their lives in defending. And, and they, the volunteer, they were not asked by Naval to do it. Yeah, I don't know if any of this really means much. I mean, it's, it's not, this is, you know, we're really uh, going off. Topic. Oh, oh. Okay, I think Isaac, I think you have two, you're, you're here twice, so maybe that's causing some noise. But um, okay, so uh, yeah, I, I, I think we're down at my desk. Uh, so anyway, I think, um, yeah, I, I don't think it's so applicable, this whole thing. We're, we're really, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't want to, you know, I can't even agree with, with everything that was said uh, regarding this. Uh, I, I think it's important to just, con to just realize that it would be hard to give the death penalty in this scenario. It doesn't seem like it, deser it deserves a death penalty. And, and that's why the commentaries have to figure out what exactly is the death penalty. And the only thing that they come up with really is this Moirid Bamalchus, which means uh, that, he, that he rebelled against the king who we're, we're, we're claiming is David. David is the king. Now, is David really a king? We're going to soon see. This is something of, of interest now. I mean, you know, David was anointed. Does everyone know that he's king? At what point is that anointing going to take place? And so we we really have to have to deal with with these these type of questions uh, soon. We're gonna we're gonna see more about this. So we're now in verse uh, fourteen, and. Um, I do want to just read for you, and there is a psalm of uh, Psalm of chap chapter 109, where it's talking about David running away, of course, from Shaul. He's, but it seems like he's referring to this story here, where, where he says... They have surrounded me with words of hate and attacked me with, without a cause. In verse 4, in return for my love, they hate me. Still, I am a man of prayer. They place harm upon me in return for my favor and hatred in return for my love. It seems like he might be referring to 
this story of all the help that he gave Novel's workers, and yet they are just, and yet uh, Novel is repaying it with, with hatred. And he might also be talking about in general, the people in the uh, people of Judah, who it's his, the tribe that he's from, they weren't very warm to him. Appoint a wicked man over him, let an adversary stand at his right. When he is judged, may he go out condemned, may his prayer be considered a sin, may his days be few, may another take his position, may his children be orphans and his wife a widow, may his children wander about and beg, may they seek charity from amid their ruins, may the creditor seize all that he has, and may strangers plunder the fruits of his labor, may he have none who extends him kindness, and may none be gracious to his orphans. May his posterity be cut off. May their name be erased in a later generation. May the iniquity of his fathers be remembered by the Lord. And may the sin of his mother not be erased. Anyway, it's, it seems that maybe he's referring to those who, and, and then he talks later, really, maybe in the, in the, in the, in the later part, he says, um, For I am poor and destitute. Mm, one second. May they be before the Lord always, and may he cut off their memory from the earth, because he did not remember to do kindness, and he pursued the poor and destitute man and the brokenhearted to kill him. He loved the curse, and it has come upon him. He did not desire blessing, and it has remained far from him. He donned the curse like his garment, and it came like water into his innards, like oil into his bones. May it, be like a, may it be to him like a cloak in which he wraps himself as a belt, which he girds himself always. This is from the Lord for the deeds of my enemies, for those who speak evil against my soul. So here he's talking about those who really, you know, did not have mercy and, uh, and uh, cared about, about uh, his life. So that's verse 109 in Tehillim. And uh, now we go continue the story that David is bringing his group of people, 400 people with him to kill out Novel and uh, possibly those that are helping him. And verse uh, 14, one young man from the attendants told Abigail, now this is a, attendant of um uh, of novel now one of novel's workers told novel saying behold david told novel's wife abigail saying david sent messengers from the wilderness to greet our master and he drove them off so the attendant is a little nervous or very nervous because I'm sorry, which pericle we in 25 Verse 25, okay, sorry. We just finished verse 14, chapter yeah. 25. So he, uh, the, the, the attendant of Novel told Novel's wife, he says, you know, we're, 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 we're doomed. We're going we're gonna to get murdered over here because look at yeah. what our master, your husband, just did to David, who helped us many times. These men were very good to us. Verse 15. We were not shamed, nor were we lacking anything all the days that we traveled with them when we were in the field. They were a protective wall over us, both by night and by day, all the days we were with them tending the sheep. And now be aware and determine what to do, for the evil decree has been made final against our master, against our entire household, and he himself is too base of a person to talk to. So this attendant realizes the danger that they're in, Novel is obviously not 
uh, uh, aware of, of, of what a foolish uh, thing he did. Now, what's, what, what, what the verse now tells us is that uh, Abigail, all the details of what she decided to bring. So Abigail hurried and took 200 breads, two containers of wine, five cooked sheep, five saws of toasted grain, 100 raisin clusters, 200 cakes of pressed figs. She put them on the donkeys. She said to her attendants, go on ahead of me. Behold, I am coming behind you. But she did not tell Novel, her husband. Of course not. <laughs> it's not going to tell him that she's going to give all this to David. Uh, but, um, and, uh, and so she's going to, so she's sending this now to David because she really is saving the life of her husband and maybe others. Now, what, what really is surprising here, well, not surprising to us, but it's something that's uh, interesting to think about, is that imagine if Novel would just been stingy and said, you know what, I, uh, I'm not going to give you any meat, but I'll, I'll give you, I have uh, 50 uh, loaves of bread, let me give you, you know. He could have given them something cheap and just gotten them out of there, and they would have been appreciative. You could have gotten away with the little, you know, eighteen dollars. You know, you could have. You gave eighteen dollars, uh, fifty dollars. You know, you could have. You can't give eighteen. Okay, that's that's what all the poor, poor people give. Uh, fifty, a hundred dollars. Give a little donation, a hundred bucks. Here, what ended up happening? You had to give a thousand bucks. She had to. She decided. You know, uh, if he would have at first just given something normal, you know, okay, here's a, you know, uh, fifty loaves of bread. We're gonna give you fifty loaves of bread. You guys will have what you need for yontiv. You know, you can make kiddush on, on bread if you have nothing else. He could have uh, could have done that, but it, and they would have been appreciative. They would have maybe they expected more, but at least they, they would have been thankful. You know, but instead, what does he have to do? He has to give the, the, the now she's got to like appease him. Now she's got to win him over. So it's like a, a the the idea here is that sometimes, you know, you, if he wants to be now, if he wants to be cheap. He, he could have done it in a smart way. Of course, that's also foolish, being cheap, because uh, tzedakah is a great opportunity. But if he did want to be cheap, at least they use, use a little seichel. But uh, unfortunately, uh, he foolishly uh, made this uh, mistake. And, um, and uh, ultimately, Abigail had to bring her, uh, you know, spread out the, the, um, the red carpet for... Uh, for David and his people, and, and like bring them all this uh, the, the sheep, the uh, the raisin clusters, and the cakes of fig, the 200 breads, two containers of wine. So she said to her servants to, uh, that they should go ahead of her. Now, why did she do that? So the simple explanation is because she wanted to calm David down. She she was she understood that you know they're they're angry, and. Uh, she that first you need to calm the person down and then she'll meet with him afterwards to try to 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 uh try to annul his de de uh, desire try to um uh, remove his desire that he probably wants to kill Neville. now the verse uh Verse 20, then it happened as she was riding on the donkey, descended, descending by the, the hidden part of the mountain, behold, David and his men were descending toward her, and she met them. So they're coming from one way, and she's coming from the other direction, and they ultimately, they meet. And... Uh, The Gemara talks about this story. There's a Gemara in Megillah. The Talmud mentions this, uh, this story over here where it says that Avigail was a prophetess. This is a very interesting Gemara. The Gemara here tells us that it brings this verse that she went down on a donkey in the Seser Hahar. The Seser Hahar means in the in the uh, the hidden part of the mountain, what does that mean? You should just say he went down the mountain. What is what is it saying? The the hidden part of the mountain. 
So Rabbi Bar Shmuel says that Abigail decided to ask David a halachic question. So she comes, she's coming one direction. David's coming from the other direction. And she tells David, you know, uh, I need you to get, to give render me a, a, a decision in Jewish law. Uh, I want to know if I am tame, if I'm impure, because a woman that menstruates is impure. And sometimes a woman uh, has like a, um, uh, uh, some type of a emission that's unclear if it's, if it's uh, menstruation blood or if it's just uh, uh, some type of emission. And so the Talmud talks about the different colors of blood that would be considered tame, or if they're considered tahor. Tame means impure or pure. Um, and uh, there are four colors of, um, of, of red blood that are impure and one color of black that's impure. And, uh, you know, great, there were people that specialized in deciding what blood, you know, in, in, in knowing the laws of which blood is pure, the blood has to come from the uterus and it can't, uh, it's, it's complicated laws, but that's how they, they were able, they were able to tell the different bloods and to, could tell a woman if they saw the blood. So it says the hiddenness, it means that she showed David some blood that came from a hidden place to ask him, is this blood Tame or Tahar? So David answered her and said, you know, I'm, I'm not allowed to judge at night because we don't really have good, we can't see the, the actual color of the blood so clearly at night. You have to wait for the daytime, for the sunlight. So you can't really judge such laws at night. So, so that's what David answered her. So she answered back, oh, you can't judge, you can't judge uh, blood at night. Because So but how are you judging the death penalty at night. So all of a sudden, her wisdom, her, 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 her great brilliance uh, came out. And she said, oh, you can't, you can't judge at night. What about, uh, what about uh, giving a, a verdict on a, on, a, on a death penalty? That you could do at night? And uh, so that, he said, David answered back and he said, Moirid b'malchusu. Novel is a moirid b'malchus. He's someone who's rebellious against the king. And I don't need to judge him a death penalty because the, the seemingly the, the law of moirid b'malchus, um, the, the, either I don't need to give him, a, I don't need to judge him. When it comes to the law of rebelliousness, we don't have to have a court case. We can if the king understands this to be a, a, a someone who's rebelling, he's allowed to kill without a court case. That's one way of looking at it. Another understanding, another explanation of this is that you don't have all the rules of a regular court case, and therefore you could even do this at night. And um, Abigail answered back, and she said, what do you mean? He's Myred Bamalfus. He's rebelling against the king. What do you mean? Shaul is still king, and you has not your your um, your tivacha, your mission has not yet been revealed in the world, and Novel is not a myriad b'malchus. And and he answered her. David answered her. He said, which we'll see a verse a little in a little while. It says, "Blessed is your reasoning." And blessed are you that you prevented me from coming into bloods, from killing someone. That's what it would, would seem like. You saved me from, from killing Novel, because what you just told me is that really I am not considered a full-fledged Melech. Now, what it seems like is that maybe he initially and his people felt that once Shaul uh, acknowledged that the kingship should go to him, that was the final um, moment that he's meant to, that he's now he's now considered considers himself a melech. Possibly that would be the moment because Shmuel passed away 
and he anointed me. And now Shaul acknowledged it. And so what left is what, what's left. And Avigail comes and proves all the rabbis wrong. She says, you know what? It's not exactly as you think. If Shaul is still alive, then you are not officially Melech yet. Now, the Gemara continues, and it, it's a very interesting Gemara because it's, it's based on um, the, this word in a future verse. And the, the, uh, actually, maybe we should, let, let's go further and maybe we'll get up to it. Uh, let, let's go back into the, and I, I'll continue the Gemara in a, in a few minutes, um, but let's go back to where we are here. So the men, um, the, uh, th- th- this is what, this is this discussion that she's having with David HaMelech. She brings, she, she has, she sends these people um, in front of her. And then she arrives and she asks David HaMelech this question. And we are in verse 21. Now David had said it was for naught. It was for naught that I guarded all this man's possessions in the desert. And there was not missing anything from all that belonged to him. Yet he has repaid my kindness with evil. Such shall God do to David's enemies. And such shall he do further. If I leave over until morning of all that belongs to him. So much as a mashtin bakir. Mashtin bakir. A simple explanation is so much as a dog or as a man. Different explanations what the word means. What the, 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 what the intent is. But the, the point is that he's sort of making some type of a promise here. As uh, the Metudas David says, Inyan Shvua, this is a promise. And he's saying, uh, uh, he doesn't say what's going to happen, but so should happen if, if there's anything left from this man. Uh, so he's planning on, 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 on definitely killing Novel. And now verse 23 is, when Abigail saw David, uh, she hurried and dismounted from the mount, the donkey, and fell on her face before David and prostrated herself to the ground. She fell at his feet and said, "With me, myself, my lord, lies the with with me, myself, my lord, lies the sin. Let your maidservant please speak in your ears and hear out the words of your maidservant. Let my lord not set his heart against this base man, against Novel, for he is, as his name implies." Novel is his name, and revulsion is his trait. And I, your maidservant, did not see my Lord's attendants, whom you sent. So I would have given you food if I saw you, but I didn't see your people. And don't be so angry at this man, Novel. Now, my Lord, as Hashem lives, and by your life, as Hashem has prevented you from coming to Dumim, bloodshed, and from your own hand avenging you, may all your enemies and all those who wish evil upon my Lord, be like Novel. So what she's basically saying is the food is for you. And Novel is powerless. He can't harm you. You shouldn't feel embarrassed of him. And most importantly, he's not going to live long. And uh, there's no need for you to kill him. Where is that? That he's not going to live long. Rashi uh, says it over here that um, ye, ye you can novel all your enemies should be like novel. She's based, she's prophesizing with Ruach HaKodesh that he's not going to live long. This is Rashi's uh-huh. interpretation. Um, the Radak says they they will all be like Novel. They won't. They will be powerless against you. But Rashi says uh, they they won't live long, and and we know that we know that the, he ended up dying. Two days later. <laughs> so so uh, uh, the verse here says, "I prevented you from coming, or Hashem has prevented you um, uh, from coming to bloodshed, Dumin. And uh, from your own hand, um, he saved your hand from avenging you. May all your enemies be like Novel, and uh, and all those who wish evil upon my Lord be like Novel. 
Okay. And now this homage that your maidservant has brought to my Lord, let it be given to the attendants who are traveling with the Lord. And um, uh, please forgive the sin of your maidservant, for Hashem shall certainly make for my Lord an enduring house, for my Lord fights the wars of Hashem, and no blame has been found in you in your days. So she's honoring the king, honoring David Amelech, and telling him, and uh, saying, um, um, he's melchamais Hashem, and uh, no evil will uh, will endure, will will happen to you. No even no blame, no 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 ra, no blame, no no sin has been loitimse uh, b'cha miyamecha in your days. Now, a man has risen up to pursue you and to seek your life. May my Lord's sword be bound, soul be bound in the bond of life with Hashem, your God, and may he hurl away the soul of your enemies as one shoots a stone from a slingshot. This is a really uh, important uh, verse to talk about. So let's, um, let me do the Gemara Until here. now, I never knew that it came from Avigail. That's what I find fascinating. Heinous, it's something that we say at every Levaya, and right. we talk about it, and it's from Abigail. That, right. The heinous muscle, the It's on every kever. It's on every on, right. on every stone. Tough men, tough men. If anyone so wants to know those letters, the, they're letters that we put on a stone. It's from this verse. But maybe we'll talk about it next week. Let me do the. Let me uh, finish off the Gemara that we were learning, and then we'll talk about this uh, next week. This verse. So the uh, the story continued in the Gemara. We are the Gemara. The the verse that we read in verse uh, twenty six said that Hashem prevented you from coming to bloods, double language bloods. What is the two bloods that Hashem has prevented you from coming to? So here it says, this teaches us, Shegilsa es shayka, that somehow Abigail's, uh, some, uh, uh, some, uh, uh, her, her shayk, her thigh was uh, revealed it, it, at some point, whether she was walking, somehow got a little re got revealed, and v'halach le'ura, and he went towards uh, towards her sholish uh, parsois, like um, uh, two and a half miles, and ran after her. Amar la, so it says David said to her, Hashmi'ili, please, please, you know she was such a beautiful woman. He said, I hope you'll. You'll, you'll live with me. And she said to him, uh, that this should not be a uh, stumbling block a, uh, for, towards you from, if I, you know, th this shouldn't be against you as one of your um, failures. And what she meant to say was that David, David had a great desire to, to live with her. And she uh, knew in prophecy that David is going to have some claim against him at some point. As we know the story of Bathsheba, when David marries uh, this woman who's questionably uh, married to someone else and so on. And uh, uh, David is going to have a sin. And she tells David now, this should not be your stumbling block. This one shouldn't be your sin. In other words, she is prophesizing that there is a different place where he's going to have a sin. And that is why we call her a Nevi'ah. That is the proof that she was a prophetess. It is from this wording that she words to David that this shouldn't be, uh, this won't be your you're a place where you're going to have your, 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 you're going to fall. It's going to be somewhere else. And that's the story of Bathsheba. Now, the, um, the commentaries all ask, what does that mean? David, uh, David was not a lowlife. He was one of the holiest people and he can't control his desire. And so, uh, uh, what, so and, and he's going to marry, he's going to live with a, ma a woman who's married. Her husband's alive. He's going to, that's a, that's, a, that's a serious, uh, very, uh, one of the three most serious sins in the entire 
uh, Torah, is uh, adultery, living with a married woman. And so the commentary, one of the commentaries explains that it means that David was telling her that we're going to be heading to kill Naval now. And after we kill him, I want you to marry me. She obviously understood it that he wants now. And she said, don't let this be a place of sin. But what David had in mind was that, uh, that, that they would, um, you know, after Novel dies, after he kills her, that, that uh, David would, would, would live with her. And, um, and so that's the meaning that there were uh, two bloods Either number one, killing the blood of Novel, and and um, and living with her, which which actually actually I should say it differently. I said that because uh, living with her, she understood it to mean now probably not. Maybe she understood also live with her after he kills Novel, but. She just showed him some blood. And what was the blood that she showed him? It's, it's dark at night. We don't know if, it's, if she's pure or impure. Now, a woman that's impure can't live with her husband. So if, she just, if she's in the middle of menstrual, if this is menstrual blood, so she wouldn't be allowed to, uh, uh, to, live, with, with, to live with David. And therefore, David, it, she's, she's saying that um, uh, Hashem has prevented you from one blood killing novel, and the second blood, the fact that we can't live together until we find out if I am tame or tar, if I am pure or impure. So that's that's the uh, that's the uh, explanation over here, and um, and this is how the Gemara proves that uh, she is a prophetess. Okay, any questions?